Tonight on KQED Newsroom. The durability of plastics is why we love them. You can wrap it, unwrap it, and wrap it again. But it's also the real problem out in the environment. A special report about the impact of plastics on our environment. If plastics were a country, it would be the fifth largest emitter of greenhouse gases globally. And on our health. The smaller the particle, the deeper it's going to make it into our bodies, and the more likely it is to interact with our cells. Hello and welcome. I'm Priya David Clemens. Tonight, we bring you a special episode of KQED Newsroom that's all about plastic. It's a big part of our everyday lives. Plastic keeps our food fresh. It's made all kinds of advanced medical equipment possible. And it's a key component in a broad range of innovations, from cars to computers, from phones to contact lenses. But new research is finding plastic in places you wouldn't expect, in our water, in salt, and in the placentas of pregnant women. Tiny particles of microplastics are in the air we breathe and in the waters of the San Francisco Bay. In this KQED Newsroom special, we look at what this proliferation of plastic means and what California is doing to fight plastic pollution. Reporter Monica Lamb has our special report. Every minute, one million plastic bags get used around the world, and most bags get used for only 15 minutes. 10 million tons of discarded plastic end up in the ocean every year. That's about one garbage truckload every minute. When we got around the bend, it looked like the sand was rainbow colored. And when we got down to the beach, it was actually microplastics. Promises that recycling plastic will keep it from becoming litter are wearing thin. We all think that we've done our part when we take the plastic bottle and put it into the blue bin, assuming, hey, our job is done. But the reality is, the vast majority of all those materials, they're not getting recycled. Most of us are just wish cycling. In California alone, more than 12,000 tons of plastic end up in landfills every single day. The list of plastics in the dump is long and varied. Cups and lids, trays, bags and forks, just to name a few. So what is California doing to stop plastic waste? For a long time, I thought that everything I put into my recycling bin was getting recycled and finding new life as another useful product. After all, most plastics are labeled with a number, the recycling symbol, and even the words recyclable. But when I started learning that most plastics are in fact not getting recycled, I started looking into why not. What does it take to recycle something? California loves recycling. The state started one of the earliest programs in the country. Local governments and businesses have invested millions of dollars in recycling systems, in trucks that pick it up from your house, and take it to massive facilities, where discarded aluminum, glass, paper, plastic are gathered up again. This would represent about 60 tons an hour, and this site runs two shifts a day, so we're processing on a typical day here 800 to 1,000 tons, and generally we're processing just around a little over 20,000 tons a month. Pete Keller is the Vice President of Sustainability for Republic Waste. At this facility in Milpitas, trucks bring in recyclables from households throughout Silicon Valley. Their aim is to keep as much of it out of landfill as possible. So tell me, what is it that we see here? So this is uh, generated at households throughout the region. What we're looking at here right now is about 180 tons of material. Most of this arrives here in transfer vehicles, so like a large semi-truck. This is what we call a tip floor. Over here to my left is a waste handler. But first, they have to sort, sort, sort through a mountain of material. They need to separate aluminum from cardboard, glass bottles from plastic bottles, and they need to pick out lots and lots of garbage like these electronics, this backpack, these curtains, and this, well, it's not clear what that is. So this is the cardboard after it's been through the OCC screen. Keller says there's value in recycling. It's good for the environment, and it's good business when there are buyers who want to make recycled products. Like those plastic jugs that milk comes in, there's a high demand for those. So an example of that right over here. So this is what we call uh, high-density polyethylene natural. 
these materials are non-pigmented, so any downstream consumer of this material could turn it into any color they wanted to. Okay. So in today's marketplace, uh, this is the most valuable commodity that we produce at, at this location. In fact, it's the most valuable commodity we produce anywhere in the country. And because of that demand in the marketplace today, this is trading for over a dollar a pound or over $2,000 per ton. Wish we had more of it. But that's only one kind of plastic. Plastic comes in different chemical formulations with varying density, transparency, and in a rainbow of colors. So in this pile alone, how many different kinds of plastic do you think there are? Oh, thousands. Yeah, thousands of different formulations for sure, uh, particularly when you get into the flexible packaging. And that's one of the biggest problems with recycling plastic, the immense variety. Manufacturers need large, reliable supplies of the same kind of plastic. And it's not just a matter of separating plastic from non-plastic. Even among plastics, the different types must be separated. This is just an example of some common household product. I'm not trying to name names here, but literally three different types of plastic. One, two, three, with a metal spring inside. So that's just one common product made of four different materials. Five of you include the label. And then there are plastics that cannot be recycled at all. So this is another example. This is a flexible mailer, you know, a little blister pack. And obviously, we're starting to see a lot more of these. Um, this particular shipper is transitioning some of their smaller shipments away from cardboard into something like this. So this is an example of something that today is very difficult to recycle. So all the flexible packaging and the wide variety of plastics that are in that pile brought in every day by the recycling trucks? So what happens to them? Most often, landfill. Yep, he said landfill. Every day, California discards enough plastic to fill more than 200 Olympic-sized swimming pools, according to state agency CalRecycle. The problem is, in order for the promise of recycling to work, someone has to buy used plastic, clean it, and turn it into something new. California lawmakers have been looking for ways to generate more demand for recycled plastic so that one product will get made into another one and eventually into another one. What I wanted to make sure is we were actually going to have a circular economy. Thank you. Today, California Assembly member Phil Ting is checking out a mobile recycling center that travels to different neighborhoods to make recycling easier. Soda, Stonestown, what are the locations? Ting wrote a law requiring that new beverage bottles contain some recycled plastic because recycled plastic costs more than new plastic, what's also called virgin resin. So we wanted to make sure that the recycling was happening here in California. We had a number of manufacturers, recycling manufacturers, who were struggling because there wasn't enough market for their product, which is who we want to support because these are California jobs. They're good jobs. They're part of adding to our circular economy. So we're actually recycling this plastic in California and then reusing it in California, which is very exciting. They want to print the barcode on there directly. Under Ting's law, which was enacted in 2020, all plastic beverage bottles must contain no less than 25% recycled plastic by the year 2025, and no less than 50% recycled plastic by the year 2030. The assembly is now in session. That bill was the first of its kind in the country. Now, Ting wants to expand that approach by targeting another common plastic product, thermoform plastic, which is frequently used to box strawberries and make cups. This is a typical picture for a lot of us. If you go to the beach, you see a lot of the red Solo cups. These are items that we are working to try to get recycled. Right now, these products aren't recycled. Over time, plastic breaks apart into smaller and smaller pieces. And until recently, not much attention was paid to how plastic affects human health. I'll get the sieves ready. That's slowly starting to change. My field is emerging contaminants and microplastics. So I look at contaminants that haven't really been regulated yet, but are getting out into the environment. Here on the shores of the San Francisco Bay, Dr. Rebecca Sutton and her team have been trying to measure how much plastic is in the bay. They're not looking for large, obvious plastic waste like forks or cups, but rather something that's much harder to measure, microplastics. Microplastics are tiny pieces of plastic smaller than five millimeters. And when you've got these small bits, it actually becomes pretty easy for these little tiny particles to be ingested or inhaled, and that's when you get the exposure and potential for harm. So what we're holding right here are two stacked sieves that we 
pour the water through. So this way we can simultaneously collect two different particle size fractions, getting larger and smaller microplastics. In 2019, Sutton and her team published the results of their three-year study. They found microplastics in the surface waters of the bay and in the mud. They found them in stormwater runoff, treated wastewater, and every type of fish they sampled. Their study suggests that the San Francisco Bay has more microplastic pollution than most major water bodies in the United States. The two most common types of microplastics they found were fibers from clothing and small bits from tires. Oh yeah, we have found microplastics in just about every sample we collected. And this is pretty consistent with what you see all around the world. Pretty much everywhere you look for it, you are gonna find microplastics. That's why in 2018, California decided to start finding out just how much microplastic is in our drinking water. It's another first of its kind effort in the country. Sometimes you can see the largest microplastics in the sand, sometimes floating in the water, but the vast majority of them are impossible to see with the naked eye. Dr. Scott Coffin is a senior scientist with the California Water Board. His job is to establish what levels of microplastics are safe in drinking water. One of the reasons that plastic in drinking water has received recent attention, especially by California's legislators, is that we know that the amount is increasing. Coffin says there are over 2,400 chemicals frequently added to plastics that are potentially dangerous. Many are endocrine disruptors that change how our hormones work. Others are known toxins, and some even cause intellectual disabilities. So you can think of plastic as a carrier for other chemicals, and in many ways it's like a sponge. And once it's in the environment, it can pick up all of the other pollutants that are already there. Coffin is analyzing the results of studies from around the world. It is still a new field of research, but scientists have found that microplastics are able to enter into our cells. Smaller particles are typically more toxic. The smaller the particle, the more likely it is to interact with our cells, causing toxicity. One study even found microplastics in four out of six placentas examined. They found that the particles were both on the maternal and the fetal side of the placenta. This suggests that the plastic particles are actually being transferred from the mother to the developing fetus. That's some small microplastics if it can get down to that level. The particles identified were smaller than 10 micrometers, which is about the width of a hair. I wanted to know just how ubiquitous microplastics are, so I asked, where have scientists found microplastics? A better question would be, where have microplastics not been found? It seems everywhere we've looked, we've found them, from Mount Everest to the Mariana Trench. Every organism, really, that we've ever looked, we've found some levels. And at this point, I'm not sure that there exists a place that is not impacted by plastic pollution. Ever since plastic was first invented in the mid-1800s, it has revolutionized manufacturing. From telephones to saran wrap, their production has proliferated. Now look at this. Saran wrap clings like magic. In 1950, only about 2 million tons of plastic were produced worldwide. There's my vinyl plastic shower curtain and cap and my new hairbrush. Your refrigerator is full of plastics, too. My refrigerator? And there are a lot of instances where plastics have been a perfect replacement for other materials. And these uses are becoming greater every day. Over the past 70 years, plastic production has grown exponentially to about 400 million tons annually. You've seen the telephone lines from the air, but what you can't see is the coaxial cable that hooks up the whole nation in one amazing telephone network. Plastic packaging, the largest sector of the market, makes it possible to ship products around the globe, get our coffee to go, and keep our food fresh. With plastic an essential part of so many products, the plastics industry and the recycling sector are looking for ways to make it easier to recycle. Kate Eagles is a program director with the Association of Plastic Recyclers. And why not just stop using plastic in the packaging? Enter into other materials, you mean? Yeah, possibly. But I think we're pretty committed to using some kind of packaging. And yeah. Plastics are very light, they're very flexible. The association's members include petroleum and chemical companies, and they promote best practices for plastic manufacturers. 
And this is an example of a popular uh, ready-to-drink tea brand that used to have a clunky metal top, but the designers realized that that was preventing it from being recycling compatible, and so ultimately they've changed it to a, a plastic closure cap. Chemists have also found ways to innovate on plastic resins to make them easier to recycle. So they wanted to have a handle, but initially in order to have that handle, it had to be made of a resin that was just not compatible with the primary recycling stream. So over time, they developed a different resin that did allow it to be fully recyclable. Of the estimated 9 billion tons of plastic that have been produced in the past century and a half, only an estimated 9% has been recycled. The manufacturing of new plastic in the U.S. alone produces over 100 million tons of carbon dioxide or equivalent greenhouse gases every year. That's about the same as running 50, 500 megawatt coal-burning power plants. And more plastic factories are planned or already under construction. Plastics just isn't a pollution issue, it's a greenhouse gas and climate kind of issue that we have to confront and we're serious about confronting in California. Plastic starts with oil, so from an industry perspective, as we move to electrification of cars, there is a glut of oil on the market and plastics is the future. Many policy and environmental advocates say it's time we manufacture less plastic. So California has passed laws to ban plastic microbeads and body washes and limit when restaurants can hand out plastic utensils. California was the first state to ban carry out plastic grocery bags and the first to stop hotels from handing out small shampoo bottles although that law won't go into effect until 2023. But broader, more ambitious legislation has failed repeatedly. There was an attempt to ban the use of plastic packaging in e-commerce. Globally, the e-commerce industry uses nearly 2.1 billion, with a B, pounds of plastic packaging. This is low-hanging fruit members and something that is really, really a scourge. That bill didn't pass. And Phil Ting's attempts to increase the recycling of those red Solo cups and strawberry containers, that bill didn't make it. And another bill that would have forced manufacturers to slash the amount of waste generated by single-use plastic products by 75 percent? SB 54 shifts the cost of the end-of-life management of this material to the producers. That bill got shelved. So we will go to the phone lines for opposition to SB 54. This is Gail Delahant on behalf of the 3,000 fresh produce farmers of Western Growers Association. We are opposed to the Household and Commercial Products Association, the Pet Food Institute, and the National Aerosol Association. We are all opposed on behalf of the Personal Care Products Council, also opposed on behalf of Novelex. We also currently have an opposed less than that position. On behalf of the Plastics Industry Association, we respectfully oppose. The California Farm Bureau also opposed the American Institute for Packaging and the Environment, and the Flexible Packaging Association also in an opposed less amended. Good afternoon. This is the California Restaurant Association. We are also opposed unless amended. Thank you. You know, I can't tell you and point to a particular member of the legislature who's, you know, been bought um, by these things, but I can tell you we are deeply outgunned <laughs> on the environmental front about the resources. It takes actually a lot of money to, like, push back against that, but, but these industries have it, and they've been using it. Lobbyist Jennifer Fearing has worked for years with nonprofit environmental groups to push for tougher regulation of plastic production and waste management. Even with our super duper Democratic majority and consistently two thirds of Californians saying this is a huge problem that needs to get addressed, we have really struggled um, to get enough votes. So we, we did oppose that bill. Tim Shestek is senior director of state affairs with the American Chemistry Council, a trade group of plastics and chemical companies. He says they support efforts to reduce plastic waste, but disagree with the approach of bills like SB 54 to outright ban certain products. This bill, does it go too far? Uh, does it provide opportunities for the business community to comply in a, in a reasonable fashion? Uh, but in our view, it didn't take into account uh, some of the other trade-offs that, that we, we, we like, to, like to discuss. Light weighting, uh, fuel efficiency, uh, greenhouse gas emissions associated with potential alternatives. Shestek wants to see greater investment in recycling infrastructure and policies that are applied comprehensively to all kinds of packaging, not just plastic. Let's talk about future goals for the American Chemistry Council. Do members of your group, in particular petroleum industries, have plans to up the production of resin, that is virgin plastic resin? 
Um, so you have a variety of different applications from building and construction to water piping to insulation, medical devices, electronics that are using our materials. But the materials that do go into packaging, uh, we understand we got to figure out a way to make sure that they don't end up in disposal. As lawmakers and lobbyists wrangle over policy, startup businesses are trying to innovate our way out of our reliance on plastic. When the COVID-19 pandemic shut down restaurants and bars, but allowed takeout and delivery, entrepreneur Lindsay Hole watched as plastic takeout containers piled up. We went from dining in and dining at offices to now everything is takeout and delivery. Everyone is getting grocery boxes. And the waste implications are really terrifying. Her idea, create takeout containers that are reusable over and over again. Her company, Dispatch Goods, makes their containers out of stainless steel with a silicon lid. So this is one of our containers. Um, so this is a 50 ounce. And essentially a customer will get this and then they can text the number for collection. And with that, they'll get notified of what day we collect in their neighborhood. Awesome, thank you very much. Or they could find a return bin. We now have about 40 return bins throughout the Bay Area. And so if they decide to use a return bin, they just scan this QR code so that we mark it as returned, and then they just drop it in there. Customers pay extra for this service. Kind of what we call the avocado upcharge. Have a great day. Hole says, so far, customers willingly pay for it because they want to avoid creating more plastic waste. And what we've learned is that the value to customers is alleviation of eco-guilt. Now we have data showing that we're driving business to restaurants that are making the shift. So it's not just a sustainability decision, but it's a good business decision. Good morning. How are you doing? Something that's more unexpected, it's a solid dish soap. Other entrepreneurs are creating products and opening up stores that eliminate packaging altogether, like these solid body care and cleaning products that don't need a container. You wet it and then you rub it here and then you do your dishes. Wow. And that's it. And no bottle of any kind. And no bottle of any kind. No need to refill, no need to return your bottle, nothing. Just a bar. What is this? So these are toothpaste tablets. So you just take one tab, put it in your mouth, crush it a little bit, and then brush your teeth, and that's it. Another one that I really like are uh, lotion bars. This one's lemon vanilla. It smells nice. Yeah, yeah. So do I just grab it out yeah, of here? Yeah, you and... just grab it, and, then... and you just rub it on your skin. Wow. That's well, pretty straightforward. Yeah, it's super easy. We have a cutlery kit. Here at Oxford Elementary in Berkeley, these students have found other ways to use less plastic. They bring their own reusable utensils to school every day. This is really good with the bamboo sticks. So we have 38 total bags. This class gave itself a challenge to make so little waste over the course of a school year that it fits into a tiny little container. Welcome to our zero waste classroom. Something special about us is this is all we're going to be using for a whole year and we have no trash cans. And then I got 95 gallons. Good. Jacqueline Omania is their teacher. Each year unrolls with the kids taking the lead. I asked them, would you like to do this? And then they agreed. And then we decided what our goal was. So today they calculated our diversion from the landfill waste using our math skills. What's the equation? 34 plus Let's write that one down. So this really makes the math come alive and allows them to see the impact of their work. These are our zero waste classroom results from last Friday. I mean, the larger issue is these youth are growing up in a climate crisis and how to make them feel empowered and give them the skills to know how to inform themselves, how to work with one another, how to work with the community. Redistribute the things you own but do not use. And be able to have an impact, make things better. Are you ready? Omania's students have taken her lessons to heart and taken them outside of the classroom. Miss Omania! This group of students organizes their own beach cleanups. It's food packaging. What's the kind of stuff you saw so far today? We found oh, like candy wrappers. We found a vodka bottle thing. Yeah, we. We it's found, I mean, the, the big brands are like Coke, Coca-Cola, Coca we find There's these a, a lot. Yeah, we find a lot of styrofoam. Yeah, we usually find really old, worn down cigarette butts. We found a boot. We found like a, a shoe. We, yeah. found a yes. we found a hat. Yes, we found a hat. We found like a full-blown computer case one.
Omania's students also petitioned the Berkeley City Council to put strict limits on single-use plastics in restaurants. If it is possible for a class of third graders to get all their trash from this school year into this can, then I think it is possible for the adults of Berkeley to reduce their waste. So I believe the adults need to step up so we don't make the environmental waste in the first place. Let's start this new disposable free dining ordinance and save this planet. Thank you. The new law, which passed that night, requires that all dining utensils be reusable and that all takeout utensils be compostable. I want to thank the students at Oxford School for coming tonight and sharing your thoughts. Um, personally, I want to say you give me hope. You give me hope for the future. These students are not the only ones who are impatient to see change. Climate change is here. It's urgent to do something about it, and we need to actually rethink the way our world works. I don't think anyone wakes up in, in, in the morning and thinks, you know, our material ought to, ought to find its way into the oceans or creeks or streams. I think we recognize that, that we have a role to play. Some of these folks are starting to realize, like, change is coming, <laughs> and they ought to be at the table and make sure that that's change that can potentially work for them. In the fall of 2022, a ballot initiative will allow voters to weigh in on many of the same policies that legislators have tried to push through. Until then, the trade-offs will continue between convenience and impact on the environment. Every small act counts. So starting from awareness to learning about plastic pollution and the root cause of it, and then using that awareness. As we take individual action and make broad governmental moves. We have so much information right now, and a lot of things in the world aren't working, but that is an opportunity for things to change. Absolutely, California is a leader. We say this often. We're tracking this in California. You guys need to pay attention because eventually it'll come to a theater near you. All to tackle California's plastic problem. For KQED Newsroom, I'm Monica Lamb. We hope you enjoyed our special report. If you want to share your ideas for solutions or legislative change, or just your reactions to this story, email us at knr at kqed.org. You can find KQED Newsroom online anytime and on Twitter and Facebook. And you can reach me on Twitter at Priya D. Clemens. Thank you and good night.